Anyone's watching? Zero viewers. No viewers. And the beans and rice one? No, that's in the house. It's the is it cheese one. The one that doesn't have anything. Anything written on it? Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Well, should yeah, I come? Yeah, totally. I'm just advertising it. Ladies are gonna kill it. Oh, Dominic. I'm excited. <laughs> Damn. I know, right? Are you talking to you? Thanks. Thank you. Um, I literally have to do this. So you brought a coming. Marilyn, I think it's coming too. It's really delayed. Is it just like the? Is it just because of the? Thank you. 
Interesting enough. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, it was, you know, it's a reminder that, yeah. I'm 
the event and the human rights issues of immigration. So, <laughs> so um, a little over a year ago, I led an alternative spring break trip to El Paso, Texas to learn about um, immigration at the border, where we heard of diversity speaks. Um, as we attempted to piece together our complicated immigration system, our, our perspective of the world began to change. For many of us, it was difficult to come back to Boston knowing the things we knew and continue our lives as if nothing, nothing uh, had happened. So we formed Everson Unite, and since then we have been the first student-led force on campus that fights for immigration awareness and immigrant rights. We're only a year old, so it was awesome. I'll take a spring break with such a formative experience. It meant a lot to us. Um, more recently um, in our history, you know, Emerson has made headway when President Pelton and Vice President Spears um, tasked the formation of a working group led by the director of um, the Alma Lewis Center for Civic Engagement and Research, Kelly Bates, um, to examine our policies um, of you know, support um, for students who are undocumented in the, in the efforts of making our school more inclusive. Um, so right now, what we are looking at is looking at ways to make our school, you know, better in, in those ways, and to present to President Pelton a series of recommendations of how to move forward. Um, so hopefully, you know, in the future, we can move towards that goal. Um, through our education, we as a community, members, educators, and more importantly, humans, um, you know, like Angela Davis recently said, immigration is one of the civil rights issues of our of our time. It's the major civil rights issue of our time. Um, so, you know, through education, through initiatives like this, through what UNITE is doing, visiting classrooms, um, doing advocacy campaigns, participating in our, our political landscape, you know, we can, we can make a difference um, in this, in the civil rights issue of our time. Um, we are proud to present Emerson uh, with this wonderful opportunity to learn about immigration on the border from a man who has been living and working there for many years. We first heard from him during our trip to El Paso, and he made a lasting impression on us. So much so that we wanted to share him with the rest of our community, so that we can move forward um, through his education. So I'm here to give a little bit of a bio um, before we start. So Julia Garcia is a native of the border, born and raised in El Paso, Texas. Jesuit educated, he attended the universities of Rockers in Kansas City, Missouri, and Seattle University in Seattle, Washington. From 1970 to 1978, he served as director of the Youth and Young Adult Department of the Catholic Diocese of El Paso. In 1978, Ruben, along with four other young adults, founded an Annunciation House, with whom he has been with ever since, serving as its director. For over 36 years, the House of Hospitality, operated by Annunciation House on the U.S.-Mexican border in El Paso, Texas, have provided hospitality to over 125,000 immigrants, refugees, and undocumented persons from Mexico, Central America, and 40 other countries. In the course of his service with Annunciation House, he took on the responsibility of six siblings from El Salvador whose parents were assassinated in the Civil War in that country. In response to the great need for pro bono legal representation brought about by the tremendous flow of refugees from El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Honduras, navigating the El Paso Juarez corridor in the early 1980s, Annunciation House helped found the Las Americas Refugee Asylum Project to provide immigration legal representation to asylum seekers. He then served as the first president of Las Americas Board of Director. In 2012, Pax Christi USA, the National Catholic Peace Movement Organization, named him its Pax Christi USA Teacher of Peace recipient. Please join us in welcoming Joel Garcia. Perhaps my starting point would be is can you hear me? The microphone working? Okay, all right. Um, first of all, I I want to say thank you very much for your invitation to come and be here with you this evening. Um, clearly, a special thanks has to um, Gulf Naomi, who navigated uh, all the correspondence, communication between me and, and Emerson in the process of getting me here to 
in Boston. I'm very grateful that I'm here in April and not in February. I was commenting earlier that I saw as we were walking outside, there was a young man coming in a pair of shorts and just a t-shirt, and I'm saying to myself, he's got to be cold. And they say to me, well, this is like summer for us here. Okay. Um, let me uh, let me start by explaining to you why it is that I accept invitations like this one here from Emerson. When Annunciation House was in the process of being founded, we were going through a process of trying to discern a group of young adults not very different from yourselves begun to gather at the end of 1976. And what they were basically trying to answer was the question of, how does one live life with a greater sense of purpose and meaning and death? How do we do that? We were asking that question in El Paso, Texas at the end of 1976. And we wanted to have a sense that how we live and who we are at that particular moment in our lives as young adults made a difference. We wanted to experience a deeper sense of purpose and meaning in our lives. And so we were wrestling with that question. Along the process, because we met every week for over a year, along the process, we came to understand that if we wanted to answer the question, that perhaps it would best be answered by placing ourselves among the poor and allowing the poor to lead the way. We found the second floor of an old building in the downtown area of El Paso, and we asked for permission to use the second floor. No, no strings attached. That building, which used to belong to the Catholic diocese, the diocese didn't use the building, and it would lend it out. It would lend it out on this kind of, you can use the building, we won't charge rent, but we don't want any responsibility for the building. You worry about the plumbing and electricity and everything else. It was a very old building, so that was a big issue. And, and the diocese had been lending the building that way to various organizations. And we found out that the second floor of this building was being vacated by the organization that was using it at that particular moment. And at that moment that we went and asked, lend us the building, and lo and behold, the bishop said, I'll lend it to you no strings attached. We arbitrarily set the 3rd of February as the move-in date, and from that group that had been meeting for over a year, five of us made the decision to move into the second floor. We quit our jobs. For those of us that were working, we quit our jobs. For those of us that were going to school, we dropped out of school. And we moved in to live simply, and to try and understand in El Paso, in 1978, who are the poor. And I think this is really important for you to understand. It wasn't a matter of who we thought the poor were, but rather, who are the poor. And one of the things that we discovered is that we all have ideas about who the poor are. That is different from who, in fact, are the poor in your midst. In 1978, in El Paso, there were only two shelters, Salvation Army and the Rescue Mission, only two. And we did not know that if you were undocumented, neither one of the two shelters would give you emergency shelter. So if you were a woman with three kids who had crossed the river and you were out under a bridge, if you went to the Salvation Army or if you went to the rescue mission, they would not allow you to 
to stay. They would not provide shelter because you were illegal. Okay? And so we asked ourselves the question, in 1978, who in El Paso would be among the force of the poor? And the answer that we came up with was the undocumented. And so we made the decision, because we had the second floor of this building, and, and there were only five of us, we had space, we had four space. We made the decision that if there was no place for undocumented people to sleep and spend the night, we would begin to take in the undocumented. And indeed we did. We simply said, if we encounter an undocumented person, we're going to offer them hospitality if they need it. And very quietly, no fanfare, no press conferences, no signs of the, nothing. Just on our own, we met the first undocumented person and we said to him, you can stay with us. And then from that first person, it led us to a second one, and to a third, and to a fourth. I have very vivid memories because the second floor was empty. When we moved in, we slept on the floor. We had we had no resources, we had no funding source, we had no income. We didn't have to pay rent. We would beg for our food. And so our first dining room table was a box, just a box that we turned upside down and we got half of a sheet that we put over it and we would sit around the floor. Our first refrigerator was one of those milk machines that you have in your cafeteria that you can raise it, and except we used it as a refrigerator. Okay. And so I have very vivid memories that when we were able to get some pieces of plywood, we actually built dining room tables out of this plywood. Today, 36 years later, if you go into the dining room of Annunciation House, I will show you two of the tables that we still use that got made way back when. I would, you know, the health department would never approve it. You know, we just make sure that whenever the health department comes by that they have table calls over so you can't see them. Okay. And I have vivid memories of sitting around the tables and there might have been 10, 11 immigrants sitting and saying to one of the other volunteers, boy, the house is really full right now. Never imagine that there would come a day when there would be over 115 people in the building at one time. At that point, we were receiving so many Central Americans that were coming up from the countries of war and crossing the border, crossing the river, and had no place to go. And they were staying with us. I got people I used to tease the guys because on, on the first floor, by this point, we had already control of the entire building. The people using the first floor left, we just took it over. And we put the guys, all the men would sleep on the first floor, and of course, a lot of them on the floor, and I used to tease them. I said, make sure at nights when you're asleep, when you fall asleep, that you sleep with your mouth closed, because if you don't, someone's going to get up to use the bathroom, and you're going to take somebody's toe in the mouth. Okay. When we started Annunciation House, I used to speak about it from the perspective of the poor and our response to the poor. You might say that to a certain extent, I would context what Annunciation House did within the context of some kind of charity. But then 
something begun that happened over time and as a result of the people staying in our houses. I would sit next to people at breakfast time, at lunch, at dinner. I live in the building with them. It was nonstop interaction with all of these immigrants that were passing through the house and the stories. The stories and the stories and the stories kept coming. And little by little, those stories began to change me. I started becoming a different person because of what I was hearing. I began to understand an incredibly intimate connection between me and the people that were arriving at the house. And over time, it is the immigrant that has given me my voice. And when I speak, it is their voice that you are hearing. And little by little, I came to realize and I came to experience and to live the question of the immigrant, the question of immigration, as an utterly justice issue. And today, it is an utterly justice issue. I need you to understand that because when I speak, I can be very blunt. And I may say some things that may upset you. I, I should correct that. I hope I do say some things that upset you. I hope I say some things that light a fire in you. I hope I say some things that offend you and that anger you. The people that stay in our houses are in desperation. And I'll be frank with you, they have no time for your requirement of nicety. Until you have a sense of desperation, will you understand that there's not a whole lot of space for nicety. During the 1980s, when we started seeing people from Central America, and when I speak about the connection between myself and the immigrant, one of the things that I try to communicate is that of the myths that we live with. In the 1980s, and that was probably before many of you were even born, in the 1980s, my government was sending hundreds of millions of dollars to the government of El Salvador and the government of Guatemala. And a lot of that money was going specifically, it was earmarked for the military and security forces. This was a time when my government was saying that the battles in Central America are battles between communism and democracy. These are battles that we need to be involved in in those countries because if we don't stop communism in those countries, then it will creep up from Central America, it will come into Mexico, and then we'll be having that battle right on the border of the United States. I remember very vividly Ronald Reagan asking the question, would you prefer to fight the communists in El Salvador or Nicaragua or on the Rio Grande? And so we sent our tax dollars down there to fight communism. There was an incredible spread of death squads in Central America. Many people were dying to the death squads, and it was the death squads that were driving tens of thousands of people out of these countries. 
Human rights groups kept asking the State Department in Washington and the Reagan administration to explain the connection between U.S. funds and the death squads in Central America. And I have very vivid memories of the Secretary of State James Baker addressing the press and saying, we are pressing the government of El Salvador very, very hard, demanding that they guarantee us that the military, the government, is not involved with death squads. And our embassy is insistent that there be no connection. On the contrary, that the government be very proactively trying to bring the death squads under control. And then one day, there in El Paso, at Annunciation House, there's this 22-year-old young man from El Salvador who's in the house who crossed the border, and he's very removed, which is very different from your, your normal Central America state of the house. Very removed. And the other volunteers said to me, do you notice how removed he is? And I said, yeah, I, I, I noticed that. And, and I made a conscious effort to begin to engage him and to try and create some level of trust. When that trust was created, I finally sat down with him and I asked him, What's going on? What are you planning to do? Why did you come? And now comes the struggle. I was in the military. I got drafted at the age of 17 into the Salvadorian Army. I got drafted. I was sent out of, to the mountains to fight the guerrilla. I fought the guerrilla. I survived. I was in the military for three years. After three years, I was discharged. I am the oldest of a large family. My mom is a single mom. When I got released from the military, I went back to my village, and there's no work. There's no work. I couldn't find any work. We were hungry. There were days we couldn't even eat. And so me and another friend of mine that also got released, we started talking about re-enlisting. At least, I would get a paycheck, I could help my family, and so they re-enlisted. They went back into the Salvadorian Army, and after they went through boot camp again, they were, he was told that he was being placed in a special unit. He went to that unit, he was headed by a lieutenant, and the lieutenant explains to this unit of about 35 other soldiers that they were a special unit and that their job was to go after urban subversivos, el subversivo urbano, the urban guerrilla. When he first heard that, he had no problems with that. You know, he says, when I was in the military before, they sent me up into the mountains, you know, and I shot at guerrillas and they shot back at me. You know, and, and they were making their best effort to kill me. And I was making my best effort, and so we were fine with each other. So when they said we're going to go after urban girls, I, I had no problems with that. But then we were subdivided into small cells. We were told that when we went out on operations, we were to disguise ourselves. We didn't go out in uniform, but we were given everything we needed. We were given unmarked jeeps. We were given M16. We were given disguises. And then we were given the names of two, three individuals that on that particular night we would go into their homes and we would simply, it would be two in the morning, and we would just break the door down and we would go in in full gear after the person that supposedly lived here. And sometimes we would break in, and that person wasn't sleeping there anymore. Other times we would go in, and the person was there. And we would arrest them, and then we would search the house for everything. And when I asked them, 
evidence of what? what? What was the evidence you were looking for? Were they a member of a union? Were they a university student? Were there any flyers of any kind of rallies or meetings? Were they a catechist? And then what would you do? We would load them onto the jeep and we would take them. And where would you take them? We would take them to military bases. And what would you do there? We would interrogate them. And what were your techniques? We would torture them. We would torture them until they would confess. Confess to what? We would torture them until they would confess to being an urban getting ghetto. And I asked him, don't you think that when you're torturing someone, you can pretty well get them to confess to anything? And that it really made no difference. And what would happen to them? Some of them died because of the torture. And then we would just throw their bodies away in garbage dumps. I asked if, were they ever actually charged with anything? No. Were they taken before a judge? No. Were they allowed to make a phone call? No. Were they allowed to be represented by anybody? No. I asked him, why did you leave? And he said, because we began to notice that there were some people in the unit that stopped coming when we asked, where did they go? We were told they were transferred to another unit. And at first, that made sense. But then little by little, it began to down, dawn on them. They're being killed. They're being killed for what they know. And sitting in an Annunciation house, and I'm having this person say to me, I was in the military, and the death squad I was in was being operated straight out of the military. And there's that moment when I say to myself, I have to somehow get this information to the State Department in Washington because they don't know this. And then it hit me. It hit me that my government is bold face lying to me and the American people. When James Baker stood before the cameras and said, there is no connection, we are doing everything within our power to ensure that there is no connection between the death squad and the government and the military, he knew there was a connection and he just simply lied to the American people. Right now, the United States is making available under Plan Merida about $1.6 billion to the Mexican government. A majority of that money is earmarked for the Mexican military and the security forces of Mexico. La Policía Federal, the Federal Police, Municipal Police, State Police in Mexico. We just finished presenting the Voice of the Voiceless Award to a journalist by the name of Anabel Hernandez. Write that down and when you go home, part of your homework assignment or whatever, Google Anabel, journalist Anabel Hernandez. Anabel Hernandez lives with 24-hour security protection provided by the Mexican government because of the death threats to her. She has two children. She lives in Mexico City. Because as a journalist, she wrote a book that has been already translated, Narcoland, that established the link between the administration of Vicente Fox, the president of Mexico, and the cartels. 
As part of the Voice of the Voiceless event, we researched the number of journalists that have been killed in Mexico during the past 10 years, and we were able to identify 151 journalists. And then we searched for their photographs. And then we put together a presentation, and on the wall, the outside wall of Annunciation House, on Thursday, April the 3rd, at night, we started with a press conference, and then we projected onto the wall the photographs and the names and the dates that they were assassinated of 151 journalists. When Annabelle gave her acceptance speech for Voice of the Voiceless, she said over 60% of the journalists that Annunciation House projected were killed as a direct result of government, Mexican government instructions or connection. 60%. They were killed because they were reporting on what was going on. Okay. Caught, caught into this environment are hundreds of thousands of immigrants. And they are immigrants who then reach situations that leave them no choice but to flee. And I need you to understand that when they flee, they don't have the opportunity to put their things in order. They flee and they lose everything. And they arrive at ports of entry. They cross the border in desperation, them and their family. Some who tell us about having lost already family members. Others who tell us about having been kidnapped or tortured themselves or been extorted or been threatened. And so they flee. And then when they arrive in the United States and they ask for asylum, we turn down 98 out of every 100 Mexican petitions for asylum. The reason I say that the immigrant is the one who has given me my voice is because I want us to understand the connection between us and the immigrant. As I sit here and I look over this group of young people, I know, I know that you all have been present at parties of other young people at which marijuana was smoked and cocaine was snorted. And I'm here to say to you, the blood that is being shed in Mexico is partly started right here in Boston among Emerson students who participate in those kinds of moments. And then you try and wash your hands of the responsibility, and then when those families are tortured and kidnapped and killed, and they flee, we say no to them. And we say no as if we have some level of righteousness with which to say no. We have a woman staying with us right now. She's from Honduras. She left Honduras because she has four daughters. Small daughters. She left them with her mom and she headed out to the United States, like so many people, to eat. I need to feed my daughters. And in Honduras, I can't them. I don't get paid in a way that I can feed them. I need to understand, we're not talking about getting them 
new pairs of shoes or getting them a cell phone or an iPad. I'm talking about food. I'm literally talking about whether or not tonight my daughters eat or don't eat. And so she charts off. And she comes up through Mexico, and it takes her several months to come up through Mexico. She ends up on the border between Mexico, California, and Mexicali in Mexico. And there in Mexicali, she arrives, she stays at a Casa del Migrante, and through the Casa del Migrante, they tell her about this lady that's got this little, small candy-making factory and piñata-making factory. And so she goes, and she gets work with this lady. And so she starts working for the lady, the lady pays her, and she's actually able to send some money home to Honduras. She's still hoping to come across people that can show her how to cross into the U.S. there at Alexa, how to navigate that border crossing. So she's working in this candy piñata factory. She rents a tiny little room. She's sending a little bit of money home. She's, she's making pesos, you know, which maybe, maybe she's making $40 in a week, $30, $40, and this is like six days of work. One day, she's going home, and there's this vehicle that she notices but doesn't give a lot of thought to. And she gets to the corner of the street, and somebody puts a cloth over her mouth and pulls her back, and she passes out. It, it had to be some kind of anesthetic. When she wakes up, she wakes up in this run-down room, small little room that has a dirt floor. The rocks are still there. There's a hole for a bathroom or a toilet. And then they come in and they say to her, we want the phone numbers of family members that can ransom you. She realizes, I have been kidnapped by one of the gangs that, it, that are now so pervasive in Mexico. She has no phone numbers to give them. There's nobody that she can think of that's got any money. And they keep saying to her, you don't give us phone numbers, someone doesn't give money for you, you're going to die here. They would come in and they would be here. She says that they always had some kind of a hood. Then they started coming in and they would strip her naked and they would rape her. She says sometimes they would do that two and three times here. I never even saw their faces. They held her there for three months. In the process, she got pregnant. In the room that she was in, there was a small window high up on the wall. She could occasionally hear noise outside, and so she gathered as many of the rocks that were in that room to stand on top of them to try and look out the window. And one day she hears an older woman out in the alley and she signals, she starts calling out to her and the woman says to her, there are some people out in the front who can hear you. So she stopped. A while later, this elderly woman, that to this day she doesn't know her name, this elderly woman returns with a wooden ladder, climbs up the wooden ladder, and she brings a hammer and a chisel. And she starts breaking the bars on the window off. She gets down, she gets the ladder, and she pushes the ladder through the window so that this woman could then climb up the ladder, goes up to the window, and jumps out. And the woman says to her, run, run. And she runs. She's barefooted. She encountered a bus driver and said to the bus driver, I have no money. 
police called me and the bus driver must have realized that she was in some kind of trauma and says, come on in. And she says, leave me as close as you can to the castle that you've done. And leaves her. She walks away and says, go down this two streets. She goes down the two streets and goes to the castle that you've done where she stays there for two months while she tries and, and calm down. There at the Casa del Migrante, they made contact again with a lady that had the piñata of the candy factory. She takes her in again, only this time she lets her stay there at the factory. She goes back to the factory, stays there. In the meantime, her valley is getting bigger. And one day, looking out the window, she sees a vehicle that looks very familiar to the one that was used for the ticker. And then she realized, I'm never going to be free. And that moment, she decided, I'm crossing the border. Whatever happens, happens. And she crossed the border. She was already eight months pregnant when she crossed. She crossed over, border patrol picked her up, and transported her to San Diego. There in San Diego, she is processed. She's run through the computer, and of course, there's nothing on the computer about her. They decide to then transport her from San Diego to El Paso. But because she might be, you know, related to Osama bin Laden somehow, they put chains on her hands. And that chain goes down to a waist chain around her waist that then goes down to ankle chains that they then put on her. The, the ankle chains were so tight, and she said to them, they're very tight. And they said, that's the way it is. That's the way they loaded her onto the plane, and they flew her. Well, Paso, about eight and a half months pregnant. She gets to El Paso, and when she's walked into the detention facility, the first thing that the agent there does is look at her and ask her, didn't you tell them that the chains were too tight? And she says, I told them that, but they said that's the way it is. The reason he did that was because she, he looks down at her ankles, and her ankle is beneath because of the chain. He then takes off the chains, calls in for medical assistance, brings in a photographer to photograph and to document this. I want you to understand, this isn't about documenting the treatment of human beings. This was to document, to protect themselves, cover your ass policy. And then they make the decision to release her. And she has nobody. So she comes to stay with us. Two weeks later, she gives birth to this beautiful little girl. I want you to understand that this is being done in our name. I want you to understand that that's the result of our immense fear of the immigrant, of our insatiable need for security. This is the result of what happens in a government that has become so corrupted because of the trafficking of drug dollars. Your consumption of marijuana, of cocaine, I'm here today to say to you that if you are using drugs, you have blood on your hand. Pure, simply, you have blood on your hand. And you have an obligation to do one of two things. Either you stop using drugs or you get them legalized. But until one of those two things happen, you stay away from sending more money into Mexico that then traumatizes human beings. 
like has happened to this woman. Our people have helped me to understand how we are intimately connected to the immigrant. We are connected to the immigrant economically. Because of the multiplication of maquiladoras and maquiladora labor that produces, if, if I ask everyone to stand around the room and let's make a circle, okay, and let's embarrass each other a little bit. Let's stand around the circle, all of us, and then let's say we are all going to look at our clothing. And if the clothing is not made in the United States where people are being paid at least the minimum, we take it off and we put it in the middle of the room. Every single piece of clothing that isn't manufactured in the U.S., we take off and we put it in the middle of the room. Now you tell me, after we all do that, what are we going to look like standing around this room? You're right. We're all going to be standing naked. Okay. And what do we do when we get bored? We go into the malls. We go into the mall and we see what the latest is. And we buy it. And we pay with our $20 bills. And don't we look for the sales? Don't we look for the sales to see where the bargains are? Never thinking that behind that bargain is a human being that is struggling to feed their children. And if they dare to come into the United States, I'm going to say, you illegal, what are you doing here? You come to take advantage of me. I'm hardworking. And you're coming to leech off the system. How many of you are aware that the vast majority of the disposable supplies in United States hospitals are made in maquiladoras in Mexico? How many of you know that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, go into an emergency room and just sit in the emergency room and watch them go through all the supplies, all the catheters. And they're all made in maquiladoras by people, our employees, that we are paying 60, 70 cents an hour under the illusion that that's okay because Everything is so inexpensive in Mexico. There's an organization in El Paso that periodically does a basic basket comparison between El Paso and Juarez. And they have this 20 item list, beans, eggs, rice, milk, cooking oil. It's 20 basic items. And then they go to several different stores in Juarez and purchase them and then average out the cost. And then they come to El Paso, same list, and they go to different stores in El Paso and average out the cost. And half the time, that basic basket is more expensive in Juarez than it is in El Paso. And so we say, it's okay to pay people like that because everything's so inexpensive. But God help them if they should say, I can't feed my kids on that and cross the border. Oops, there it is, the illegals again. Today, and, and I do this everywhere I go, at the hotel that I'm staying, the housekeepers. You know, it is so special. I walked out, and the housekeepers are changing the rooms, getting them ready. And I go, and I say hello to them in Spanish, and you should see the expression on their face. It's like, where are you from? And I talk to them in Spanish, y señora, ¿de dónde es usted? Y que, que, ¿cómo está? ¿Cómo está yendo? Just talking to them. 
And then another one of the housekeepers here, and she comes to join the conversation. And there's this guy that is cleaning the trash bins up, and he comes over. And they have this look on their face. You know. You know who we are. You know where we come from. You understand. It's their voice. It's their voice. And I'm here today to say to you that you and I are intimately connected to the immigrant. This isn't some theoretical connection. This isn't some pie in the sky, religion type of connection. This is a very down to earth, practical, dollar and cent connection to people. I am able to live differently because of that connection. My standard of living is enhanced because of that connection. And part of what I have to do is I have to ask myself, who am I? And what is it that all of this is saying to me in regards to the end? And here we are, at a moment in our history in the United States, where Congress has turned the immigration issue into such an incredible political football that is utterly connected to the worst biases and instincts of the American people. Shame on Congress for their utter and complete failure to reverence the people that founded this country and who wrote that magnificent constitution. Those magnificent words that say to us self-evident truths about human beings being unequivocally equal, not because we say it, but because it comes from a creator who gives life. How dare to have a Congress like we had, who so utterly has failed to provide the leadership. It is Congress that is supposed to be the ones that look at the people and say, my responsibility is to bring us to a greater understanding of the truth. And instead, we have deteriorated into being nothing more than takers of the current winds so that I can maintain my power. It falls on you to send Congress a different message and to say how poorly you have served them, how utterly poorly you have served them, that you have failed to rise to that level of eloquence, that level of truth, that set this country on its path. We need to change the immigration reality in our country. Our people that pass through our house are people that are fleeing the violence in Mexico. We are now actually seeing more and more people fleeing the violence in Central America. They are people that are clean up and they're asking to be able to sit at the table. You and I are coming up with all kinds of reasons to keep them from being able to sit at the table. One of the things that I was saying to Andrea and Naomi was that I'm really struck. I've been here all day long. I am really struck by the level of, of acknowledgement, almost like a level of reverence that you extend to each other. I see an incredible desire to want to acknowledge everybody's right, everybody's place. I have seen a community of students that is saying through their actions, this is the table, and that Emerson 
Everybody gets to sit at the table. Today, I met, my first meeting was with the workers, some of the workers, all of whom are Spanish speaking, all of whom come from Central America and Mexico. They've been working here at your school, keeping your buildings clean. They're the ones that clean your bathrooms. I've used several of your bathrooms. They're immaculately clean. They clean your bathrooms. You know, they clean your bathrooms. They clean your floors. You know, and they've been invited to be part of a clan. They were sitting around the table. This is a community where you have said it is a priority for us that people be able to come to the table. That is in total contradiction to what the immigration issue is. Whether you decide to allow someone to sit at the table goes to the core of who you are. I'm here tonight to say to you, if you take anything away from what I have to say to you this evening, let it be that you need to sit with yourself and define who you are. Are you going to be a human being that has a way of articulating why it is you exist? Or are you a human being that because it is so challenging to be able to figure out why I exist, that then I spend my time running away and distracting myself with a million different things, but which in the end is hollow. I really thank you for allowing me to come into your space, to come into your house, and to speak with you this evening. I hope I haven't said it to you enough. You can't imagine the story the people that have passed through our house have lived. You know. There's been so much violence. There's so much poverty. There is so much of human beings wanting to have their humanity acknowledged. And it's important for me to be able to share a little bit of that with you. I want to leave a little bit of room for questions that some of you may have, and so I would like to to, to open that up to, to questions and and, and uh, the way that, that this evening was built, it was a conversation, and, and and so far I've done most of the conversing. <laughs> so uh, your your question, yes. Um, so I know you mentioned in the beginning that there's about hundred at that particular point when the Central Americans, at that moment there were 150 people in the house. We actually operate several buildings. Right now we probably have about 70 to 80 men, women, children. So my question is, I guess, um, you provide housing for them, which is for the program, that you do with the family, some of the the number, the number one priority is to be able to say, if you arrived at the house with your two kids, the number one priority is to be able to say, yes, come on in. You'll have a place to sleep. Very, very simple. Very, very basic. They're old, run-down buildings. We might need to put you into a room that's got two beds, and you divide your family, and you're going to share beds. And then we need tons of beans. We need a lot of rice. We say to you, here you've got to, to take your turn cooking the meals, washing dishes, everybody helps out, that's an expectation. But we want you to have a safe place where you and your children can be. We're going to help while we try and understand what your situation is and what the possibilities may be, we're going to try and get your children to school. If, if, and, and, Almost no one arrives at an Annunciation House with their vaccination record. So that means we're going to take your kids, we're going to tell you where you can take your kids so they get the vaccinations with the school requires, but you can get them to school. 
and then we explain, look, the bus will come and pick them up here. They'll get breakfast and lunch at school. They'll drop them off here. Um, we then, depending on what your legal immigration status is, we'll start trying to interact with legal projects, you know, that can provide some kind of legal assessment of what your situation is. And there may be a way of working with your situation, there may not be. You may have some family, some place to help to get you in touch with them so that you can begin to think of where might I go to from Annunciation House. You may be with us for a week and you may be with us for a year. You know. So it, it, it varies situation by situation. Yes? Um, have you ever had any trouble with like ICE or like uh, you know, government forces? Border Patrol. Border Patrol trying to uh, open yeah. the house? Or... Over a 36 year period, yes, there have been some very, very difficult moments. You know, we, we've been raided. You know, it's a terrible, terrible thing to watch Border Patrol agents enter your house and run through the house and then line people up and and they put them against the wall. You know, try and imagine Border Patrol entering your house and taking your grandmother and telling her, go stand against the wall, and then they pat her down like they're going to find an AK-47 on her. And then they take her hands behind and they put handcuffs. And then they walk her off. So we've experienced that. We've also experienced Border Patrol shooting and killing one of our guests right in front of the house. So there have been some very difficult moments. Right now, we're, we're, we're at a point where the relationship is they, they have kind of taken a hands-off policy on us. You know. Over the years, Annunciation House has gained something of a national reputation. And so immigration understands that to come at Annunciation House is going to be politically costly. That's not to say that that's going to keep them. When their self-interest is involved in coming at us, they'll come at us. Somebody else? Yes? Hi. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming. And thank you for being so blunt and forthright. Because I think um, my generation is very to include that in these kind of issues. So I appreciate your um, opinion. Um, and you've been doing this work, I guess, for a very long time. And I imagine um, motivated a lot by the hard truth um, but my question is, what about your work do you love? That is so incredibly easy to answer. <laughs> I love the people. <laughs> Look. Is this being paper recorded? <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. There's there's some things that I can't afford to have lost. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll see you afterwards. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. But I love the people. <laughs> yes, in fact. you for four or five days, what would you do? If they're the dorm where you live, I cut off all food to you, what would you do? Would you leave the dorm? Yes. You would? Is that because you don't have education? It's because you're hungry. One of the most powerful forces in the, on the planet is that kind of violent poverty, understanding that the inability to feed yourself and your loved one 
is a form of violence. And whether you are a PhD or whether you are someone that cannot even write their name, when you cannot feed, you move. I'm not telling you anything new. You go back and read the history of the human race and you are going to find that migration is an intimate part of being a human being. The human species has been migrated, migrating since the human species has been identified on the planet. This is very important because contrary to what some Republicans keep trying to tell us that global warming is not an issue, that it is some kind of fabrication, global warming the changes that it's going to bring to agriculture, the lack of water is going to create the next phenomena of migration. People are going to migrate because there is no more water and because food that used to grow here no longer will grow. And you're going to have migration. And you can already hear the words that are going to be used to keep people from coming to the table and being part of the discussion of how the world handles changes in agriculture and water resources. So people have been fleeing because of the violence of poverty. People have been fleeing because of the political upheavals that come as a result of how people want to distribute the pie. You know. During the Central American years, El Salvador was a country that was literally owned by 14 families. Who do you think had access to senators and congressmen? Who do you think could get on a plane and fly to Washington and set up a lunch with a senator or a congressman? Members of those 14 families. You know. So, in Mexico, right now, I don't know, and, and, and one of the, the, the great concerns, I, I want you to, again, we go back to being a live stream, and I, I can't go into it. Um, what the reality in Mexico is right now is, is 